Alrighty. So today, uh, before we begin, I'd like to begin with our land acknowledgement. And we are meeting today on the traditional and unceded territory of the first out. peoples of the Hunkaminam language group on whose land we teach, learn, and live. So sorry for the bit of the delay. We're just trying to get things set up. And as you know, in this world of Zoom, lots of setup needs to happen. And uh, uh, But we're here and we're ready. Already. So um, just before we begin, um, uh, what is what is our context here? And uh, as I as I see you, grade twelves, moving on into the end of the year, um, seeing more and more of you um, going through a rite of passage, and that is gaining your driver's licenses. I see a lot of L's, a few N's there in the parking lot, and some of you with your cars coming in. And it reminds me of when I was your age and I got my first car. Um, and all the freedoms that go along with it and all the things that you can do when, when you're, when you're able to travel around on your own, but there's, there are a few things that, that we would like you to know and, and some things that you, as you grow up, you need to be wary of. And I want to introduce you to our speaker today. His name is Kevin Brooks and he is here sponsored by ICBC. And when Kevin was a young person around your age, uh, life for him drastically changed. And Kevin is here in the hopes that you can learn from his story. Now to date, Kevin has shared his story with thousands and thousands of others all across North America, with media engagements on television, and has even been featured in a Super Bowl commercial. We hope that his message to you is one that you can carry with you and help you make good decisions. So right. at this time, I would like to introduce Kevin to the Burnett community. Kevin, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Hello, Burnett. Good morning. Happy Friday to you all. So my name is Kevin. I'm going to share a story with you, and I'm just going to start that story right now. Um, the story takes place on a starts on a Friday. It was, uh, you know, that good feeling. It's a Friday. The weekend was was upon myself and my family and friends. There was a lot going on that weekend too. It was my sister's graduation weekend. So grade 12, is something you'll be experiencing soon. Um, yeah, my sister was all stoked to graduate. And of course the family was stoked for her. And it was, it was a big night. And Saturday night of that weekend, my youngest sister, Haley, she was just five years old at the time. And she had a dance recital. So I went to that with the family. And uh, it being the weekend and beautiful weather, there were some parties going on with my friends as well, which I was also partaking in. My girlfriend Robin was in a horse show all weekend, all kinds of stuff going on. And I look back on that weekend and just great vibes, lots of good times, and just never was there a moment where I stopped and thought like, maybe something could happen, life could be changed forever. I just didn't think that way, you know? So I didn't see it coming, I guess you could say. So and that's probably why looking back on the Saturday night, I got a phone call that there was a house party and it was just, I didn't hesitate. I hopped in my vehicle. I had a few beers uh, with me. I drank one on the way to the party and walked into that party and ran into these old school hockey buddies I hadn't seen in a while. I grew up playing hockey and the party was on and we didn't uh, stick around that party too long. We were off to go try to find another one driving around in my vehicle, obviously not smart because I was drinking, but this was pretty much the norm of the time for me and my buddies. And I remember stopping at my dad's house and we were doing a little pit stop to grab some beers the beer store was closed maybe dad's got some in the fridge which was a bad idea in the first place because he wasn't going to be too happy about that but i just remember like stopping and and standing in my driveway and just there was this moment where you know I, all these things are going through my mind like i'm drinking i shouldn't be driving i gotta wake up early tomorrow and go to like my girlfriend's horse show, I'm going to be hung over, she's not going to be happy with me, all these thoughts. I should just call tonight was really what I was thinking. Um, you know, and, and that thought was there. And I imagine you could probably relate to that. You've probably had moments in your life where there's just a pause. There's something telling you that I shouldn't be doing this. We all have that. It's there for a reason. And I was just, again, I guess a habit of just, you know, blowing that off, ignoring it. Ah, oh, whatever. Uh, you know, what's the worst could happen? And I grabbed some beers and I hopped in my car and went off to the next party. 
and things get a little foggy around there. Um, friends have filled me in on some of this stuff. Like, it sounds like we were all leaving, the four of us, leaving this party. And my friends, who I'd been with the whole night, they, uh, they finally made a smart choice in that they called a taxi to get home safe. They're not driving with me. At this point, I'm like stumbling out of the house, keys in hand, going to drive. Just stupid. So they call a taxi to get home safe, chipping a few bucks each, get a safe ride home. They have no regrets. And these days, you know, we've got Ubers, we've got Lyft, there's designated driver companies that'll drive your vehicle home. There's so many more options um, than driving impaired. And that night, there was plenty of options too, not even just taking the taxi. I could have slept at the party. I could have walked home. It wasn't far from home. Uh, I could have called for a ride, but I didn't even have to call for a ride. My parents were pretty chill about things. They knew what I was up to. And they were always just like, you know, if you're, um, whatever, if you're drinking, if you're partying, just call us, we'll give you a ride home. They were actually calling me that night and I stopped answering their calls. I wish I hadn't, but that ride was there. And, uh, you know, if you have that person you can call upon for whatever reason, not saying that you're going to be out partying, but if you are, maybe you just find yourself in a situation you don't want to be in, or there's a driver you don't want to hop in with, but you have someone you can call to get you home safe. I ask you just to recognize that's a, that's a pretty sweet deal. Get home safe, you know, get your friends home safe if you can too. Uh, why not? Looking back, I wish I had a, I could have done my thing, called my family, picked up my car the next day and uh, no offense to you, but really I, I wouldn't, well, I wouldn't be sharing the story right now, put it that way. So, um, nope, but I wanted to drive. So I hopped in my car and it was warming it up and my buddy Brendan decides that he's not taking the taxi anymore. He jumps in with me and off we go and we're going for one more party and we're not going slow. Like I never drove slow. From what it sounds like, I was going upwards of 130 kilometers an hour in a 70 zone, which is way too fast if I was sober, let alone drunk. And it's like I wasn't even just drunk. I was excessively drunk. I wasn't just speeding. I was excessively speeding. I was a new driver, inexperienced. The music's full blast. There's beers cracked. We're partying in the car. We're completely distracted. And you don't just need to be like, you know, on your phone to be distracted. There's all kinds of different distractions. We were completely distracted in that vehicle. And one of those things is enough to cause a crash, let alone all of them. It's like the more of these things you add up, speed, distraction, impairment, um, you know, inexperience, the more you increase the risk of something happening, something going down and something went down that night. And it's, it's kind of like the, you know, it, it, was, it wasn't a sharp corner. It wasn't an unfamiliar corner. I wasn't even five minutes from home. Like this is a road I drove every single day but on that night I missed the corner and my car just kept going straight and the first thing I hit was just a tiny curb basic curb six inch curb but I was going so fast even that little bump it just like launched my car in the air and when it hit the ground it hit rolling front over back and it finally stopped upside down just a mangled mess in this grassy embankment and Brendan and I were both seriously hurt Brendan hit his head he had a very serious head injury I hit my head too my head injury mild upper body was devastated dislocated left shoulder separated right shoulder busted both my collarbones torn to shreds in the broken glass losing a ton of blood fractured a vertebrae in my neck where my neck and back meet that did damage to my spinal cord and on top of all that i had a collapsed lung which is life-threatening and it was some years until you know i would learn details about myself and and Brendan's injuries, um, I actually met the paramedic who was first on scene, who bravely climbed out of her ambulance into the car um, and into my car and ultimately saved life, my life that night. Um, I met Denise, the paramedic, the mom, because some years after the crash, I spoke in her son's school, Terry Fox in Port Coquitlam, just like I'm speaking with you right now. And, uh, son that day did something that I'd love you to do. He, he went home after we're hearing the presentation and hearing what you're hearing. And he's just talking to mom. He's, he's telling his family, he's sharing the story. And when he got to the point of my name, uh, he didn't have to share anymore because his mom knew the story. She was there that night and she hadn't forgotten what she saw. And, you know, choice of shit to make in my car. And she reached out with an email and it was emotional. We got, we, we met up for coffee and yeah, I was, it was emotional for both of us. And 
what she kept saying to me is that it's a miracle I'm alive. A miracle I'm alive. And the reason I'm alive, she said, is one good choice I made that night. And this is something I always do. I've always done. I don't think about it when I hop in the car. It's the one good driving habit I had in those days. I always wear my seatbelt. I was wearing my belt that night. And it's, yeah, it's just a habit. When I hop in a vehicle, long drive, short drive, front, back, passenger, driver, doesn't doesn't matter. It's just the belt's always on. And that one good choice, that one good driving habit, uh, I was told it to saved my life. For starters, when the car hit the ground, um, you know, if I wasn't wearing my belt, I would have been thrown out of the vehicle. And that's really the job of the seatbelts to keep us in the vehicle. So if a vehicle crashes, the vehicle takes the impact rather than a human body. You know, a vehicle's metal, we're flesh and bones, right? So at 100 kilometers an hour over, you'd rather that, that vehicle hit the ground then get thrown out of it and also hit whatever you're going to hit at that speed. So I didn't fly the vehicle. The vehicle didn't roll on top of me, crushing me afterwards. None of that happened because the seatbelt kept me in the car. And then on top of that, uh, saved my life. When the car stopped rolling, it was upside down. And I was upside down because I was just in my seatbelt still. So I was just basically sitting in my seatbelt, hanging upside down in this car. And I was told that positioning saved my life. Because I like unconscious bleeding collapsed lung. If I landed any other way than upside down, just like blood and fluid would have pooled into my lungs, and there was nothing I could have done about it, I would have drowned, and I'd be dead. But I like hung upside down from a seatbelt, and the fluid that would otherwise drown me it trickled out of me while hung upside down, and I hung upside down long enough until we were found. And I don't remember being found. First ambulance, next ambulance, police, fire, lights, sirens, the whole scene, the jaws of life ripping, tearing into my car to get me out of it. Took over an hour to get me out, apparently. Jaws of life, the whole works. Uh, I don't remember the hospital ride to the hospital, just or the ambulance ride to the hospital, none of it. And it's it's my family who fills me in a lot of the next parts, and it starts with the phone call. And it's, it's that dreaded phone call that no one ever wants to get for someone they care for or love. And not to be harsh or anything, but just, I mean, straight up, like, of course, no one who cares for or loves any of you would ever want to get that phone call for you, which is why, you know, the school invites me to speak with you at ICBC Sports this message. It's just nobody ever wants that phone call. And and worse than the phone call is the knock on the door because the knock on the door means that you didn't live. My family got the call that their son, their brother been in a horrible crash. It was bad. Get to the hospital. Maybe the last time they see me alive. They're in shock to say the least. They were not prepared for what they're going to see. From the trauma, my body just swelled. It was one big bruise. My lip was split right through. It was just like dangling off my face. My arm was torn to shreds from going through the window. Um, all I could do is just step up my bedside, tell me they love me, praying for me. They were told at very best, maybe 20, 30% chance I would live. So the odds were against me. I was eventually moved to a new hospital to Vancouver General, where I, from Vancouver General to, or actually to Vancouver General, sorry, from Royal Columbian, where I continued to fight for my life. And another fight began as well. They, they were giving me all these medications, I guess, painkillers, really serious stuff. Um, I mean, opiates, essentially, legal heroin pretty much is what it is when you're getting into the morphines and probably fentanyl and all that stuff in the hospital. They were feeding me some really serious painkillers and I was reacting to that stuff. I was seeing things, I was hallucinating and I couldn't tell reality from what was a hallucination. And I remember actually seeing doctors and nurses at the end of my bed one day saying, when his parents leave tonight, we should pull him off the breather so he dies. Pull me off the breather so I die. That's what I thought they were saying, which of course they weren't. I wasn't in like the most sketchy, worst hospital ever. <laughs> this was all in my mind, but I was so, so sure it was real. And on top of that, I couldn't explain this to anybody. I couldn't yell for help if I even tried because of my collapsed lung from the crash, they, they cut a hole in my throat. You might be able to see this scar. I call it the gnar scar because it's pretty gnarly. This, there was like a tube in here or, and it, it like pumped air into my lungs and kept me alive. And where it sat, it blocked off my vocal cords. So I had no voice. So with all that going on and no voice, I guess I just started fighting. I started swinging. I'm like swinging at doctors and nurses. I'm yanking tubes out. I was a menace. So they end up like strapping me down to the bed. Now I'm tied to the bed. No more hitting anybody. No more pulling tubes out. And there wasn't just a tube in my throat. Six more down my rib cage area for the collapsed lung. 
There's a tube fed up each nostril down the throat into the stomach, one pumped nutrients in, and one pumped a stomach infection I got in the hospital out. You're probably not wanting to hear these tubes. Gross. There's only one more tube. But it's the worst tube of all. And you both the size of your pinky finger. You could possibly guess where the worst tube of all went. If you're uh, doing a little butt twitch or all oh, man like right now. Uh, you might be following where I'm going with this. It's called a catheter. And that tube goes down here. Yeah, very sensitive area. I'm not going to go into vivid detail why nobody wants a tube down there. I'm sure you could figure that out for yourselves. I definitely did not want that thing down there. I didn't want any of this. And when I look back, I mean, like that was my summer. All right. That was, that was how I was spending my summer. That all started too with like this great weekend with a, with a party, with a good time. And they started to wean me off the medication. I actually got hooked on the meds they were giving me, which we see more and more often these days. I got a message from a student yesterday just saying three years, you know, it seemed me in school many years ago and uh, had some struggles with pills, getting on like, you know, medication pills and getting addicted to them, which is pretty much epidemic these days with that stuff. Um, and then, you know, the fentanyl crisis and all that. Uh, I never messed with that stuff. I definitely was party boy, but I was never, never just for whatever reason, never got into the opiates but in the hospital i mean i had the experience of i actually was addicted to them and from what they were giving me and they couldn't just stop it because i guess if they they're saying just even just stopping the pills like cold turkey kind of thing the withdrawals alone at that point could have killed me so they just slowly dosed me down a little less each day and as it came off the meds it became more aware of my surroundings so i'm in a hospital but I, that's about all i know and the thing is, nobody had told me what had happened because they were really worried if I learned what had happened that I'd give up. I quit fighting for my life. So one day I started asking questions and I still had no voice. It's still blocked off. But you know how, you know, moms are or that motherly figure in your life, whoever that might be. It's mom, right? Like my mom took the whole summer off work. She was by my hospital bed every day. She learned to read my lips since I had no voice better than anyone else could. And she was reading my lips that day when I started to ask questions. And the first question I asked simply was just, Mom, why can I move? Why can I move? And I had no clue. And there's my mom about to break the bad news, the news that broke her heart when she learned to break it 10 times over, a million times over, telling her firstborn, her only son, the active guy, the words, Kevin, I'm really sorry, you're paralyzed. Paralyzed. Now you've got, uh, I think you got me from about here up. That's what you can see right now. Um, gonna try not to run over a cat. <laughs> I do this, but. There is a wheelchair. Yeah, that's. It's not a fancy office chair I'm sitting in, it's, it's a wheelchair. I was paralyzed in the car crash and um, you know, no trick or anything, but with the angle here that might have come as a bit of a surprise to you. Um, I could tell you, me being paralyzed, there's no one who was more surprised, devastated to, to learn that than, than me that day and just, I don't even know if you don't quite understand what being paralyzed means because I didn't get it before. Um, our brain sends messages down our spinal cord. Your body moves according to those messages. But if you damage your spinal cord, the messages don't get through. So that's feeling, moving, that's everything. So that's a game changer. That's a, a life changer for someone, especially who's young, healthy, active, living life, having fun, family, friends, future ahead. You know, things I want to do. And I imagine... Some of that probably sounds familiar to you. And I don't, I can imagine you're just, you're just out one night, you're, you're doing your thing, you're having fun with your friends and boom, you just, you wake up the next day and you know, someone's telling you you're never going to walk again and you're never going to run again. You're never going to jump again. For me, it was like never going to skateboard again, snowboard again, play hockey again, stage dive at a concert again, cliff jump again, run down a beach short of Frisbee football, skimboard, wakeboard. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. 
and that's my list. I'm sure of your own list of things you'd love to do, you plan to do, you're going to do this weekend. And yeah, just imagine you wake up one day and just boom, all of it. Everything you love, everything you need to do, everything you plan to do, just gone. Um, it just didn't seem, I don't know, how do you, how do you accept that? And my mom's like, Kevin, it's why you can't move your legs. And I, I tried to move my legs and they didn't go. And it was just so weird because of all the medications I was on. I just didn't, I didn't even, I don't know, it even dawned on me, you know, like I was like, my legs aren't moving and I start freaking out and panicking and I'm trying to move my legs and I'm trying to move my legs and they're not going. And I remember thinking a little simpler, like maybe I could just wiggle my toes because that's easier, right? Just wiggling your toes. And there's a chance right now when I just said, just wiggle your toes that some of you may have just wiggled your toes or maybe you're wiggling your toes right now. If I keep saying wiggle your toes, uh, you will wiggle your toes at some point. I can't explain it. I don't really understand why, but all I know is that uh, I hope you did wiggle your toes. I hope you do. And I hope you always can just wiggle your toes. And that's, that's really the point. Just start with something so simple as wiggling your toes and, and go from there. I haven't done that in many years. And yeah, just the hospital room. I mean, just trying to take in that reality of like, it just didn't, I don't know. It just, it just couldn't absorb that. Couldn't accept it. Didn't want to believe it. Like it was just overwhelming. And then I asked what happened and I was told it was a car crash. And I wasn't even really, like, it wasn't even a surprise. Like, I, it was almost like I knew, I don't know. Um, and the, it, that wasn't my first car crash. And the way that, you know, most of my buddies drove, like, it was kind of like we all had at least a fender bender, you know? And it, it's, this is one of these things where young people, people your age especially, and it's seen experience and a bunch of stuff. I mean, we're young. We, we make bad choices. We do stupid stuff. We take risks. We feel invincible. There's a whole lot of stuff to it. But car crashes injure and kill like your age group more than any other age group and that's an age group i was in when this crash happened and it was kind of just a regular thing you know that that there was these crashes but up to that point we'd always walked away from the crashes we'd always made a home in one piece and i and i think what can happen is when you get away with a few of these things some close calls and walk away and whatnot that you know, we might get a little bit cocky i was definitely way too cocky for my own good at that point um and i'm trying to think of like okay who was with me because i didn't remember and i'm thinking well it's a saturday night you know as the the details come out there must have been some friends with me i'm just driving around by myself partying by myself in my car and i started to ask who it was and each friend's name i guessed my mom said no and i remember i ran out of friends names it was a sense of relief that like the worst was over and my mom said no uh, there was one person with you and I asked who said it was Brendan and my thoughts were just like random I don't remember seeing Brendan that night he was with me like how's Brendan doing mom and my mom said Kev uh, I'm really sorry Brendan Brendan died Brendan's dead and you know I'm sorry to just drop that one on you uh, today I'll confess I'm doing a lot of these and uh, every one of these presentation is kind of different these days through the just doing it uh, virtually and I got a little confused and didn't realize I was actually doing the full presentation I've been doing just questions and answers and I've told this story many many times and here again I tell it today um, there's I've gotten comfortable with every single part of this story sharing it except for you know this one this one's always this part sucks it just really sucks that like my buddy died in my car and yeah, he died because like I drove drunk I drove fast I drove recklessly I just I took risks I didn't need to take and there's nothing that prepares a person for news like that like it doesn't seem real um, my mom said we heard Brendan hopped in your car in the last minute he was found in your car at his funeral I remember that word funeral that just hit me so hard because I was trying to like reason just think well maybe he just died and they're gonna save him they're gonna bring brendan back somehow it's vancouver general it's a great hospital yeah well i didn't know like weeks had passed and i didn't know brendan had been cremated there was no bringing him back and there's no saving him 
and then it just hit me like man his his family like it's just like another thing uh his parents is who and our parents were really tight like they got along really good so with all the sports we did like there we were always commuting together we were staying together um you know um like his his younger brothers and little sister running around the hockey rink playing with my sister allison like his grandparents were at so many of our games this cute couple that would you know pat us on the back when we came off the ice it was you know good game just I'm thinking of all these people as friends. Everybody who cares for loves Brendan. What have I done to these people? I've ruined their lives. And I, I don't know a word. I don't know a series of words I could share with you right now to describe the feeling. But what I can tell you is the feeling that I'd wish on no one anywhere. And that's why I'm right here sharing this story with you today. Like, I don't, I don't need to know you to never wish a story like this upon you or anyone and that is why I do this and that is you know, why I'm here this morning I remember asking how Brendan's family was doing and my mom told me they were struggling of course they just lost their son their brother so much more they're just basically trying to get through each day and she told me his parents have been calling our house and they were asking how I was doing and sorry my cat's going nuts in the background um they're asking how I was doing. They set up a donation for me because I was paralyzed. Brendan's parents had everyone pray for me at their son's funeral. And I don't like know what's going through your head right now, but when I heard that, it just, I don't know. I just automatically, I reversed it. I thought of my sisters and my family, my loved ones. Like if somebody did that to them, would I be supporting them? Would I be raising money for them? I, I don't know. It was a, I wanted to believe that was true, but there was part of me that thought maybe my mom was just telling me that, right? Try to keep me going. Um, but just hearing that just gave me, it did give me a boost that I don't know, maybe somehow, some way I'd get through this one. And that's not that I was convinced and there I wanted to get through or I deserved to. I was definitely asking questions like, why did I live? Why did Brendan die? Why am I here? Do I deserve to be alive? And more often than not, the answer to the question, you know, do I deserve to be alive was, no, I don't. And beyond that, I was thinking, well, hey, when maybe when no one's looking tonight, I can just pull this breather thing out and stop breathing. Just end it. Easier. Fair. See ya. Gone. Done. Like, I'm out. But I just couldn't do it. Like, I couldn't pull the plug and I, I couldn't end my life. And I was behind those thoughts. I would just hear in my mind over and over, but I want to live, but I want to live, but I want to live. And it was like, I had to make a choice that day. And, and I'm here so you know the choice that I made. And I can't sit here and tell you that it's been a easy road by any means, but I can't tell you without a doubt in my mind. I mean, there's just, there's no regrets on that choice to be here, to be alive, to just breathe air, speak words, be able to share this with you, just anything. Um, no regrets at all. And it was not like, okay, I want to live. Where's this wheelchair thing and hop in and carry on like the, there was this huge road ahead and it was like the most minute things you never think of that I was like fighting for. I had to learn how to breathe on my own again, which was weeks of coming off a breather and gasping for air until I just couldn't breathe anymore. And then the panic of I can't breathe and hoping doctors and nurses understood me flailing and waving my arms that I couldn't breathe because I didn't have a voice to tell them still it was blocked off air pumping to my lungs I live but always knowing the next day they're unplugging me again for longer and the next day for longer but it was like what were my options it was learn to breathe or don't I had to learn to breathe and once you know the weeks passed that I got that down um then yeah I remember I got moved out of intensive care and all my everybody could come and see me people couldn't really see me in the intensive care and that was another huge thing. It was, I don't know, when people saw me, it just, it must have just hit them. I don't know. Everybody who saw me started just crying pretty much on the spot. And I mean, talking some big, tough dudes were crying like babies. Hit my friends so hard because I think they're looking at me thinking, how many nights, how many close calls, how many reckless drives. It's like, that could be them paralyzed. That could be them who just killed a buddy. And it was just so hard to see all these people crying. Um, 
and my my job is I saw it, my reaction, like someone's upset, I, I try to crack a joke, I try to make them laugh. Um, and I would just, anything I could do, like I had where the hole had been, where the tube was in my throat, they basically, it just healed itself, grew back on its own. In the meantime, they put pretty much like red medical duct tape over the hole. And uh, that's pretty Canadian, right? Just throw some duct tape on there, eh? Uh, I found if I plugged my nose and breathed really hard, it made this kind of trumpety sound through the hole in the tape. So I got a little little trumpet coming out of my throat. I'm, I'm busting out tunes. I think nurses were like scared of me. Like, they're, what's up with this guy? But my friends just seeing that knew that was my sense of humor and that that, that would make them laugh and it would, it would stop the crying at least, you know, for a few moments. Um, anything to see them laugh. I remember just trying to make the hospital sound better. Like, hey, you know, it's not all bad in here. Like that nurse gave me a sponge bath yesterday. It was awesome, right? And they'd, they'd laugh. And I mean, fair enough. The, the nurses were cleaning me up. But it wasn't like hot, sexy, blah, blah, blah time with the nurses. They were probably cleaning up because I peed and or crapped myself. Uh, maybe a bit of an overshare, but that's that's the reality of it. That's what was going on, being paralyzed. And all of a sudden, my body just not working like it used to. Um just even eating was the first time I ate. It was everything was dyed blue. They gave me blue water and blue canned pears. Um, and the reason was like after I swallowed, they stuck a tube down the hole in my throat and suctioned out of my lungs to make sure I hadn't forgotten how to eat. I hadn't swallowed into my lungs. Can you imagine if someone came up to you today at your lunch and was like, we're going to dial that blue and then just stick a tube into your lungs and make sure you didn't swallow into your lungs. Like it's like, what? But I, you know, I didn't argue because it was like, well, it's, I'm eating. Like, I want to eat. I don't want any more of this goop they were giving me through this tube in my nostril. It was two months until I had those basics under control. I got moved to a place called GF Strong, a rehabilitation center in Vancouver where I learned to use a wheelchair and many other things. It's just day-to-day stuff. Uh, you know, stuff I did today, stuff you probably did today. Just wake up, roll over, jump into bed, shower, bath, dry off, get dressed. If you want to understand what it's like getting dressed being paralyzed the next time you're throwing on a pair of pants sit in a chair and don't stand up just sit there and try to get pants on sitting down not moving your legs not moving your hips not standing up um just how do you do it just everything and it was weeks months to learn these things and i remember as frustrating as it was trying to learn all this stuff again and there was pushback because i didn't want to i didn't want to learn this stuff i just wanted to wake up one day and walk but it doesn't work that way so some of it was definitely reluctantly learning these things. But when I would learn them, it would be a positive. You know, there was a lot of darkness and struggle going on uh, internally in my mind. And there was something to grab onto and celebrations for things like the first time I showered and dressed myself all on my own and calling my friends saying, guys, guess what? Shower, dress myself. It only took me two and a half hours, which definitely must have been like the most random phone call from my friends. And we tease the crap out of each other. Maybe you're like that with your buddies where you just give each other a hard time. Any opening, you're giving each other a hard time. It must have been so hard for them not to give me a hard time on that on that phone call. But they were there. They were just like, cool, man. Like, keep it up, buddy. Like, you're going to be home soon. And I remember, you know, some of the friends, just, it was really hard because they, it was almost like when, when stuff like this happens, I think it's human nature that we feel like we have to say something or we have to have these the right words we should understand we should be able to make sense of it or make it all better but i've learned there's there's no magic words i mean all we really you know need to do is just just answer that text or answer that phone call just show up right just be there and as simple as a gesture as a friend coming in and putting earbuds in my ears and cranking some punk rock music my favorite so i got to listen to music and not the sounds of the hospital for a day I'll never, ever forget that, you know, that meant the world. And although there was, you know, some smiles and good memories and times with friends, there was also tears and there was a lot going on. And there, I always had this feeling of when I felt good, there was like, I felt guilty. How am I smiling, feeling happy right now? Knowing my friend, my passenger, Brendan is dead. I, I struggle with that a lot. And, you know, I still can many years later. Uh, but especially in those early days, because I and I hadn't even seen his parents, I hadn't spoke to them. I still didn't even know if their support was real. And one day, my mom handed me a piece of paper, and on that piece of paper was a phone number, and the phone number was Brendan's parents, and she just said, "They're ready for your call, when you're ready to make it." 
uh, thought I was a pretty tough guy, you know. Um, yeah. That is a phone call. Oh, man. You would never want to make. Please take my word for that. I thought that was the hardest thing I'd ever have to do. Uh, and then actually his dad invited me over to their home during that phone call. And as soon as it was possible, as soon as I could get a day pass and I was just physically able just to someone to help me into a vehicle and out of one and into a chair, a uh, wheelchair, we, we went to Brendan's family's house. And I'll never forget just sitting in the living room with his family and they were actually trying to get us through the visit. And just looking around all these pictures and you probably have similar pictures in your homes like family photos and sports photos and team photos like graduation photos like all these pictures and just every picture was like another twist of the knife because I knew one person those pictures is never coming home again. And, and I knew and I'll always know who took Brendan another picture. His dad just took me outside and he's like, you know, Kev, we didn't bring you over here to blame you. He's like, the way they chose to see it, we both made that choice and I had to hop in my car. I didn't pull Brendan in, I didn't force him. And his dad said he made that choice on his own. And he knew better, just like I did. And, you know, I'm being real honest with you. And, if, you know, just be honest with yourself right now. I, you, we all know better than to do the stuff that I'm talking about right now. But whether or not, you know, on the weekend or when we got our friends in the car, or maybe we got a new car or whatever it is, whether we make those right choices or listen to that voice that says, this is a bad idea, that ends up being a choice you make. And um, his dad was just like, yeah, you both made that choice. And we both had that option for a ride home too. His parents were like mine and his dad was like, you know, any night our son could have been driving, you're the passenger. And our son goes home in a wheelchair and you don't go home at all. We get that. So I'll just blame you. And I don't think many families, you know, take that, that stance or that route. Um, when I would go to court, you know, a year and a half later, pleading guilty to the charges against me, dangerous driving, causing death, impaired driving, causing death. I'm in there, I'm pleading guilty. There's a chance I'm going to jail and I'm fine with that. I made the choice. I faced the consequence. You know, the night before court, uh, they reached out to Brendan's family for a victim impact statement and they and they went to bat for me. Like they kept me out of jail. They gave me a second chance. And this is what I do with it. And, uh, you know, whether you're a driver or you're a passenger listening to this, these are choices you're going to make the rest of your life getting in and out of vehicles. And as a driver, you know, there's a responsibility. If you look at crashes, uh, you know, mine being an example that it's usually not the driver who gets the worst of it. It's our passengers. It's the people we hit. So, like, look in the vehicle who's with you. And on the flip side of that, passengers, who are you hopping in with? Do you trust that person? That new driver, that crazy driver, that high driver, that impaired driver, that texting driver, do you trust them with your health, with your with your life? Is it worth it? Um and I'm not trying to be a party pooper by any means. I mean, enjoy your life. Have the best of times. Enjoy for sure. Um, but live your entire life. And um, just hopefully, you know, make smart choices that you all get home at the end of the night. Maybe this can just start a conversation to figure out how best to make sure everybody just gets home safe. And you can go out and have another fun night. Um, quite a road for sure from there to here um share this story with you and i'll just share one more little story before i show you a video to close this out um the journey of becoming a speaker i was i believe it or not i used to be terrified of public speaking i wish i could have started this way because the way i started was going into a gymnasium with about 600 people and doing a talk actually before that though uh there was a couple elementary schools and the way that happened is i met a man named rick hansen who actually lives in Richmond, I think, uh, the man of motion, Canadian hero, and he suggested I do a fundraiser for his foundation. And I'd had this moment at a lake, um, kind of fresh out of the chair where my mom and my little sister Haley and I went to a lake, and I watched my little sister run and jump in that lake. And it warmed my heart that I could see that, but it broke my heart that I wasn't big brother running and jumping in with her. And I remember thinking like, well, Brendan's not jumping in any lake, so maybe that's what I get. 
but also thinking, you know, what did Haley do to deserve that? Is that fair to my little sister? And it wasn't troubling her like it was me that day, but there was days I knew, like her birthday. This little girl cake and the candles would come out. Mom or dad would say, Haley, make a wish. And she would just stare at me, her big brother. And I knew her wish, you know, her only wish, a little kid that could wish for anything was her brother to walk again. Just break my heart. And that day, I remember on that beach, I was like, I have to figure this out. And I just, I found if I got my chair in a wheelie, I could get to the water. And I, I rolled up and I just rolled into the lake a bit, kind of swam out of my chair and splashed around with my sister and still had this moment where I felt like the lake was showing me up. It had one up on me and I was going to come back to that lake one day. And I didn't know in what capacity, but when I met Rick Hansen, it all clicked. And we, we trained for six months and did this big fundraiser with family and friends and volunteers and um, raised a bunch of money for charity. And from that, I got invited to speak in an elementary school. And there was a couple elementary schools and ICBC caught wind of what I was doing and we connected and that got me started in high schools. And I think really your age group needs to hear this more than, you know, in elementary schools. Um, spoke in nine provinces, uh, 30 states and counting. And I'm grateful to share this story with you today. And I, I truly hope that you're hearing it, that you're you're feeling it, you'll keep it with you should you ever need it and if you ever need a little reminder you would just wiggle your toes and please remember our story now i'm gonna show you a video now kevin uh yes. i just wanted to let you know i had to unshare your screen so that people could see you while you were talking so you, no may, problem. Have to, you may have to share your screen again okay Look at that. Okay, uh, there we go. Thanks so much, uh, and, Mr. Long, because you're helping me get through this. Um, and, and the the uh, the sound, the thing that we talked about earlier, the advanced yep. option. Share sound. Yeah, there you go. You're the best. You're. Uh... Okay. Boom.
So some other friends here that uh, I didn't share their stories, but uh, maybe another time, you know, that there's, have lost other friends, sadly, and this presentation, doing this as a way to keep their name alive. I like to always end with this little vid here. Um, To, to close her out with that that little walking clip and I'll explain why um, I do comedy as well as as uh, speaking something I, I started about four and a half years ago and uh, I was at an open mic in Vancouver chatting with a, another new comic named M. Beth and M. Beth was like dude you spoke at my school years ago and I was like oh no way cool um just like, what, what are you doing with your life? You know, she was graduated. Besides being in an open mic comedy, torturing ourselves. Um, and she said that she was working with the Rick Hansen Foundation. 
um, and that she was doing some research project. And she actually, it was her who hooked me up with that exoskeleton suit. Um, and I got up walking. And I love closing with that because it's just that connection. Um, you know, it was a student, a young person like yourself who, who sat on the same end of this story as you are right now. Just, you know, a different time different school um that got a, a man taking his first steps in 17 years it was a student one of you who made my little sister Haley's wish my whole family's wish to see me walk again come true it was a student so when i share this with you now i i just Maybe you don't quite understand or to know it yet, but I mean, every one of you has just the world ahead of you and so much potential and, you know, you're loved. You have purpose in this, in this world, in this life. And, you know, the choices that you make today, tomorrow, the rest of your lives, they, they count. And I, I truly hope that today inspires you to, to make wise choices when driving and to look out for your friends and make sure everyone gets home safe and just appreciate life and just wiggle your toes, you know, for a reminder. I'm going to go to a little Q&A here if, if we still have some time, if anyone has any any questions. Um, yeah, Kevin, we certainly do have time. Um, cool. I just want to let the students know a little bit of protocol, protocol around Q&A, if that's okay. Yeah, I'll go for it. Yeah. Um, so folks, if you do want to ask Kevin some questions, uh, can I ask you to send a message to me uh, in the chat? Just send that message in the chat. It only goes to me and I can read it out. Or if you wish to speak to Kevin on camera, uh, you can do so. I'll just call on you first. Uh, but if you do have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and I will forward that on to Kevin. I can see the chat too, so I can read them okay. if you want to. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. I'm learning as I go. <laughs> right. Right, right. Yeah, just, uh, you know what, you know what, Kevin, when you said just wiggle your toes, I found <laughs> in that part of your story, I found myself trying to wiggle my toes too. And cool. It's just a, just a reflex, I think. And I think that uh, maybe some of the kids are reflexively following along with you right then and there. Are you going to get a tattoo too or what? Uh, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Maybe I'll put my children's name on first, but yeah, uh, yeah, then after that, I'll put the, just your toes. Perfect. I, I, I'm cool with that. <laughs> uh, hey, feel free to ask anything, you guys. Don't uh, don't hesitate. Um, if there's no questions, I, I heard there's going to be a pop test, so you probably want to ask a few questions. But don't be shy. Mm -hmm. Anything you're wondering at all, because there's probably a few things you might be wondering from that. So question did pop up. Can you see it in the chat there, Kevin? No, I don't. So yeah, maybe you can't read them to me. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we have a question from Allison who's just interested in how, you know, how much has been um, for your foundation? Yeah. How much total have you been able to raise so far, thus far? Um, I mean, far. yeah, the, I don't even have a foundation now. And that's, that's something I'd like to eventually do. Um, oh. At this point, um, it's more just getting the message out and trying to, you know, keep myself living in Vancouver. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, if there, if there ever was a way to do that, I'd love to. And it was kind of getting, it was honestly getting to that point where with the book coming out and just things really expanding, um, right when COVID hit basically. So things got, kind of put on hold for a bit and, and I'm just trying to get her going again. But yeah, that's something I've always wanted to do and even to have like scholarships in Brendan's name, like stuff like that. So there's, there's definitely things that, that will come in the future. And, and that's a great question. And thanks for asking. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, we have another question here. Yeah. Uh, from Cameron. Uh, yeah. He asks, was, was the one thing you haven't quite adjusted to yet? Oh, well, that, wow. That's a good question. Um, hmm. 
I think, yeah, the thing that, you know what, the hardest thing, and I, I feel like the only sad, tragic part of this story still is really just the loss of Brendan, like that, hey, I'm in a wheelchair, but I'm still here, right? And I can still, I, I can't walk, but whatever, I can still get out and you saw the video, I can still do a lot of things and, and I try to live my life to, you know, the fullest um, and, and spend time with those I love and that's so, I have that. So the fact that Brendan's not here, that's that's been the hardest thing to adjust to for sure. And that at this point in the story, I feel like that's the one truly sad part because he doesn't come back. And um, I hope, yeah, I hope that that, you know, that that part resonated with people that it's, it's, you know, sometimes we don't, it's kind of, we can kind of go, ah, oh, whatever, it's me, I'm, you know, you, but it's, there's so many other people out there that it affects um, that, 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 that kind of just stays with forever. And that's, that's a good question. And thank you for answer for asking that. Just wondering if anybody else has any other questions um, around Kevin's, maybe around Kevin's experiences uh, since, uh, since his accident. Um, I know that a lot of the kids, I, I saw in the video that um, you also address uh, mental health issues with kids as well. I do. Yeah. I've, I've done a lot of suicide prevention work because it's a, it's a, and mental health as it's uh, I mean, it affects, they're saying one in five people and it's something that I've, you know, had my challenges with. And I was, I was giving a presentation in Langley um, when I, you know, probably a few years in and just kind of getting the real feel of what I was doing. And got a phone call from a friend that our, that our buddy Jordan had taken his life. And I actually got, it, it killed himself. I got that news at a school right before doing this. And just, I remember just like, I got introduced. What was I supposed to do? <laughs> I was in front of an entire gymnasium and just, it just was the hardest presentation I've given. And I cried my eyes out, but I, you know, I honored my friend and I mentioned his story and what had happened. And, and it, it, I got so many messages that day from students and I still get, a lot of messages from students and just so you know I, I respond to everybody but that you know a lot of people are struggling and, and even right now is just it's strange times it's tough times um i've learned that it's you know that we all have our moments we all have our things we deal with and it's important to know that there's support out there um in the community in your school uh family friends i mean you could reach out to me. I was just saying, I was writing a student back yesterday talking about, you know, pills, whatever. I There's people out there who care that, that will support. And I've learned over the years, just through doing this, it's almost like this is like my counseling session, you know, when I talk about it. People often ask me, like, how do you do that every day? You're reliving it. And it's like, well, I live it every day anyway. So I found to do something with it and bring something positive from it has been such a great way to move forward and honor my friend and his family and, and ultimately heal um, to like turn it, flip it. So it is something positive um, and just have things. I, I'm not sure if you can see my, my wicked raccoon tan right now, but I've been up until uh, today. Anyway, it's, it's not raining yet. I'm, I'm in Langley, but I've been out every day in the sunshine. I've got a hand cycle. You probably saw pictures in the thing. I'm I've getting exercise and getting outside and getting fresh air. Just, uh, I'm always trying to keep my mental health in, in check and uh, eating well and probably time I announce I'm a vegan. I got to tell you that, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just doing what I can to, uh, yeah, to, to, it, it can be a struggle for sure. And if, if you are struggling with that, just know you're not alone and know that, uh, yeah, there's, you're not the only person. Uh, and there's people out there who will, who will support you, who, who can help you through. Just, just hang on because life always gets better. I've learned that. So if, uh, if the kids want to reach you, how do they go about that? I saw that screen there with a bunch yeah. of your social. Um, yeah, so, do you have an email as well? Yeah, my email, If you can go to my website, which is kevinbrooks.ca. And my email is kevin at kevinbrooks.ca. So uh, that's that would be my email. Um, yeah. Exactly. And also, oh, I love this. I have, this is great. And my Instagram at just wiggle your toes where uh, a lot of people just check that out. There's, I'm always throwing positive things up on there and uh, maybe a little reminder 
moving and forward. What's your Twitter handle? Just just for the tw Twitter people. Ah, uh, just wiggle your toes. Oh, Thanks. Twitter. Sorry, Twitter. Twitter. Twitter yeah. is at wiggle your toes. Ah. And yeah, in the coming months, um, I'm developing. Uh, I'll be doing dropping a podcast. So I'll be doing a just wiggle your toes podcast too. So I'm kind of that's in the works right now. So stay tuned on the social media for for that as well. I'll be having based. It'll basically be me having just people that I've met um, in all my travels that have inspiring stories, uh, gnarly stories, and just to chat and keep the positive um, message getting out to people. Awesome. So, you know, uh, Kevin, at this time, uh, I just want to thank you uh, for sharing your story. Um, I know as a parent that uh, the part of the story I really connected was the phone call. That's every parent's nightmare. Yeah. Uh, to hear the physical and mental trauma that's happened for you and your loved ones is experience uh, no one would ever want. But your story is definitely a gift to us that our, our breakers will, will carry with them. So thank you for taking time to be with us. You're welcome. And thank ICBC for providing us with the opportunity. So thank you very much, Kevin. You're welcome. Thank all of you. Have a great year and stay safe. Thanks, Kevin. Before uh, the Great Tolls go, I have a quick message for them. But Kevin, if you wish to log off, do so if you wish. Uh, but thank you again. Okay, cool. No problem. Thank you so much. Thank you.